President Santorum, bailouts? No bailouts. Uh, I was against uh, the uh, TARP and against the bailouts. Um, you know, not to say that uh, you can make the case, and I think people have made the case, that they uh, uh, did have an impact in softening what would have been a very difficult um, economic uh, crisis uh, in uh, late 2008. But I think the precedent of having the government intervene in such a tremendous and, and uh, um, um, uh, significant way uh, really uh, opened up the door uh, for even further bailouts and further intervention of government with the fact that George Bush, a Republican, a, a conservative, mm -hmm. um, uh, organized a massive intervention of the federal government into the private sector. Uh, I just think set a very, very dangerous precedent. And, of course, yeah. Barack Obama has taken that precedent and driven a door through it and created this crony capitalist system that we now have in America where uh, Barack Obama and the folks in Washington pick winners and losers. They bail out some. They don't bail out others. Uh, uh, they uh, give waivers to some groups. They give wa not waivers to others. It's a Well, they're buddies. They're giving the waivers to them. It's exactly they? right. And, and it's, it, it's a very dangerous precedent to have the government intertwine that closely with whether it's the auto industry, the financial services industry, whatever it is, they're major components of the American economy that are now intertwined and in bed with the federal government. It is, a, it is I believe, one of the reasons, many reasons, why uh, the economy economy has not recovered is because we did not allow capitalism, destructive as well as constructive capitalism, to work, mm -hmm. and we didn't have the um, uh, the washout of the uh, of the bad and 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 dangerous loans and other things when uh, uh, when the opportunity presented itself. Because of course, failure has got to be an option, doesn't it? It, it has to be. You know, the moral hazard. That's another issue. I mean, look at look at who who got bailed out. Yeah. Not Main Street America didn't get bailed out. Nope. You know, the folks on Wall Street got bailed out, and they're back making their big their big bonuses. And I, that's a real that's a real issue for me. And I'm not someone people can make whatever they want to make as long as you're making honestly. Yeah. This is they didn't make it honestly, in my opinion, and and they got bailed out for doing things that were uh, clearly beyond the scale of what they should have done. And uh, and as a result, uh, I, you you've now created another example with this with this Dodd Frank bill, where you now have this too big to fail which is another reinsurance plan for Wall Street, should they go and do this uh, do this again, that, that the government is going to stand behind them again and bail them Well, out. if you're too big to fail, that, that, that creates the circumstance where you can take ridiculous risk, stupid risk where the reward might be huge, but there's no downside. Well, I mean, you there's have- literally no downside. That's right. I mean, you have folks who are, you know, in the, on the investment banking side who now, you know, can go ahead and, and fly high and take risks, and you know if they lose money, well, the shareholders lose money. They don't lose any money. I mean, they're they're gonna you know they're gonna get uh, you know the, the the debt holders uh, mm -hmm. in some cases lose money. But you know these guys are back, and they'll just uh, you know join up with another firm and, and go at it again. This is that 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 to me is a is a real problem, and we have exacerbated it with uh, the policies of this administration. Okay, now you didn't quite answer my question. However, a uh, president Santorum bailout or no bailout? Uh, I, no, I mean I said I was against all the bailouts that okay. occurred, and and uh, so, don't believe so that that's going forward. Look, for example, I'll take I'll take General Motors as an mm -hmm. example. Uh, at the time, I said General Motors should have been allowed to go into a structured bankruptcy. Yep. Uh, that way, the creditors actually would have come out owning more of General Motors and not the labor unions. Mm -hmm. But but General Motors would have come back out of bankruptcy. They could have structured it and 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 gotten shed shed some of their uh, their obligations, shed some of their contracts, and come back a healthy company without the federal government putting the taxpayers on the line. For billion, you know, for millions and millions of dollars, and uh, and again, creating the moral hazard I said before uh, by having the government intervene. Uh, what okay. would you do without without taxes? Uh, well, I think the most important thing is to uh, keep taxes and tax rates lower. I mean, mm -hmm. that 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 is the uh, the operative thing is to try to do something to reinvigorate uh, business. Obviously, businesses are struggling right now, and uh, I. I going to be coming forward with an economic plan here in the next few weeks, so I'm not mm -hmm. going to go into great detail, but uh, just let me say we're, we're looking at lower rates. Uh, we're looking at, uh, at, at, at some simplification, uh, but to me, uh, the, the most important thing is, is rates and, and growth and in, uh, incentives uh, for businesses, not incentives with you know, credits and deductions, but incentives with lower rates to, mm -hmm. uh, to drive long-term growth. That's the most important thing. All these you know, uh, cash for clunkers and temporary credits and all that stuff does not work. It does not sustain growth. What sustains growth is predictable lower rates. Mm -hmm. uh, are, you a, are you a fair tax guy, a flat tax guy, or are you just going to uh, leave the system where it is but lower the rates? Uh, I'm 
uh, I'm more of a uh, flat tax guy with respect to uh, simplification of the code, uh, taking mm-hmm. out a lot of the bells and whistles that I mentioned before that I do not believe are are, are helpful, uh, and and lowering rates as a result of that. That's that's my direction. I, I fair tax has some uh, some interest in it, but uh, I'd like to see it. You know, it's one of those things where it's a it's a brand new way of of taxation not having been tried anywhere else, and I'd, I'd like to see it at least be uh, tried in a state or two before we look at it as a replacement of the entire tax system mm. of America. Doesn't doesn't work without the repeal of the 16th Amendment. Well, that's the other thing, and, you know, it's, I, I, you know, it's just I, too dangerous it's, without uh, that. You, you, give, you give the federal government the power of a fair tax without repealing that amendment, then you've got the best, the worst of both worlds. Mm-hmm. The approval rating for Congress is, is 9%. We, we the people, <laughs> fundamentally don't trust our politicians we don't believe our politicians we got people who are making it making excuses do you think it's because of the likes of of this guy oh i wish i was representative wiener laying out my manhood in a tweet because once the ladies get a look at the wiener all of them would fall in love with me I was actually trying to test your, uh, your, your sense of humor there, but uh, you didn't actually hear what we were doing. So uh, at the end of it. But you heard the end of it. So uh, Wiener, obviously, he, uh, he, he comes all out. He says, it wasn't me. I was hacked, da-da-da-da-da. Then he basically stands up and says, well, actually, it was me. And in the press conference he's using to say it was me, he lies all over again. There was no cover-up. I didn't try and cover that up. 24 hours later, we found out he did try and cover it up. Mm-hmm. I mean, and he won't quit, and he doesn't see anything wrong with that. And his leader, Nancy Pelosi, isn't even asking him to quit. I, yeah. I find that astonishing. It, it is astonishing, and uh, you know, it's 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 sort of brazen, uh, just trying to, to figuring that his constituents will uh, will tolerate this. Uh, I'm sure he's seen his polls in his district, and I guess the polls in his district are, are tolerating this, and mm-hmm. so he fig- figures uh, this. Uh, I, I hate to say this, but so many on the left mm-hmm. are are just fixated by power. And they just they want to hold and have power, and they just have trouble giving it up. And uh, and and unfortunately, we now see more pe- some even on the middle and the right who are just you know so uh, so interested in in exercising authority, being in Washington and being in a seat of authority, and they don't realize that you know. Uh, <laughs> They are they are examples. They are leaders. The leaders have responsibilities beyond just uh, exercising power, but setting an example. And, and and what he's done, and what he's done to his family, what he's done to the reputation of the Congress, mm. has been real damage. And and you know he has. I think he has a responsibility to deal to deal with that. I um, I, I would I would hope that he would do so in an appropriate way. Uh, you, you're calling for him to quit. I'm not. I don't. I've. I've never. To my knowledge, I've never called on anybody to, to resign uh, under any circumstance because I think that's a decision people have to make, and I'm not going to weigh in. I would tell you that if I were in his shoes, I would have resigned a long time ago <laughs> yeah. and paid more attention to the people that I love, my family, and try to repair the damage that I did and obviously did to uh, to uh, to my family. Okay, I understand what you're saying to a point, but you know, perhaps this is why congressional approval stands at nine percent because i gotta i've gotta tell you senator i don't understand why you won't stand up and say the guy should quit i can say it very easily well, he's I, a scumbag I stand up and say that, I, that if i was in his position i would quit uh, yeah. and you know that's i think i think that lays out my position pretty clearly i i don't go around and you know uh, have to every time someone does something i don't approve of whether decide whether they should resign or not i i just well, think I, yeah. you just say well what would i do in those circumstances and that's what i would do and i don't want to sp- i don't want to keep talking about this but this is a united states congressman yeah, what pathetic. would a congressman have to do in order to get rick santorum to say yeah he should quit well <laughs> my, yeah, no look i mean there's a process by which we remove members of congress if they do something that that's wrong and that's and that's the process we should use i i i think going around pointing the finger and saying this guy should quit this side should stay i i, I my my feeling is you you answer the question what would you do under the circumstances and i did yeah, but that actually wasn't the question. Well, that's, but, I, that's but my the answer is I don't. I I I don't go out and tell people that they should resign. I think that's mm-hmm. a decision they have to make. I I give my opinion on what I would do. 
Mm. See, I mean, it's not the fact that he's a Democrat. I couldn't care less. By well, the way. I, not, I do that, by the way, with Republicans. And De- obviously, yeah. if I'm if I'm not willing to point the finger at a liberal Democrat who I agree nothing with, mm-hmm. uh, I, and the same thing with respect to conservatives that I that I do agree with. These are these are decisions that they should make. This is what I would do. See, I I have to, I have to say, uh, you know, I, I do. I have to say, I think that's that is actually part of the problem that you won't go that extra little bit because here is here is a, a guy who has clearly lied who has been caught lying who gave a press conference to say i was lying and then managed to lie again in the press conference uh, further lies uh, it, it's incredible that this is a united states congressman and you can't bring yourself to ask to tell him to go i i don't i just plain don't understand usually, it and i really don't do have, think that's i usually part don't of the yeah you, we can continue on this usually i i i'm pretty i'm pretty forthright on how i feel about things but when mm-hmm. it comes to those kind of person those kind of personal decisions those are decisions that if I was in the Congress, uh, depending on what I knew, I may, you know, I may, if they if they have a investigation and they bring a, a, a central resolution and you know, based on what, then, you know, I'd tell you how I'd vote. Mm-hmm. But uh, until I have all that facts and information, I'm, uh, I would not tell you how I'd vote. OK, well, um, I asked the question. You answered it. I, answered I, it. I asked that's it right. about three times and you answered it about three <laughs> times. And that's fair enough. We've got a whole bunch of people on, on hold. I, I'm, we don't have time to put them on with you, but I am going to uh, uh, ask some of the questions that they're asking. Uh, we got uh, somebody who wants to know where you stand on domestic oil production. Um, I'm a, uh, a huge fan of uh, uh, domestic oil production. I, I voted repeatedly to open up Anwar. I voted for uh, uh, deep water drilling. I've, I support uh, you know the ex- exploration for oil in the oil sands as well as offshore. Uh, I, I use the example of what uh, uh, our situation in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has uh, just discovered, we just discovered in Pennsylvania a few years ago, the second largest reserve uh, of, oil, of uh, natural gas in the world. Mm-hmm. It's called Marcella Shale. And uh, as a result of that, we're drilling about 3,000 wells a year in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, the direct result is natural gas prices are way down mm-hmm. because we are producing more in this country. Uh, we had LNG terminals, liquefied natural gas terminals, that we were building on the East Coast because we had a shortage of natural gas mm-hmm. and we were importing it. Uh, and now those LNG terminals are can be used to export because mm-hmm. we have it. We have a surplus of gas, and we can do the same thing with oil. We have plenty of oil in this country. We just need to get to it. We sure do. What is our greatest threat right now? Is it is it a threat from within or a threat from without? What I what I talk about in uh, as I as I travel around is that I think the the great threat to America is uh, a a government uh, that has uh, grown so big and so intrusive. That it really threatens the very fabric of our country. Uh, mm-hmm. That uh, the, uh, uh, as you know, as you're a Brit, uh, former Brit, uh, former Brit, but uh, you came, but now you're an American. I am indeed, right. and you're an came American not because door. that's right, not not because of of ethnicity, but you're an American because you accept an ideal of what America is. Mm-hmm. And uh, I always say that that uh, the heart of American exceptions, the heart of who we are, is. In the, in the Declaration of Independence, that we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. That phrase makes us different than any other country in the history of the world. That phrase says that rights come to us from God and that our founders said that the role of government was to protect life, liberty, and the f- pursuit of happiness. Mm-hmm. That that's the goal of America. That's the aspiration of what America is. That's sort of the value that that holds us together as a nation. And we came from countries that thought that that believed that rights went to the sovereign and yep. that the people were the subjects of the sovereign. And I think we have people in Washington, D.C. who want to go back to that system where rights can be given to to people by the government and that people become the subjects of of the uh, of of the of the president or the Congress. I think one of the reasons you see these low ratings may be Anthony Weiner, but it may be people who feel like they're being pulled around by the nose by members of Congress and the president who thinks they know better how to run their lives than, than, uh, than free people do. And I would say that we transformed the world. America transformed the world over this last 200 years because we had a belief in free people, not in strong government and not in government uh, manipulation and control of our lives. And I happen to believe that Obamacare is the linchpin of, uh, you know, if, if mm-hmm. Obamacare is implemented, uh, then America as we know it, this aspiration of, of this country that is designed with limited government to protect people to be free is over. And I quote Lady Thatcher. Mm-hmm. who said 
that she was never able to accomplish what Reagan accomplished in America uh, in Britain because of the British national health care system. That's absolutely right. You see, you see, Margaret Thatcher would never have been prime minister of England without, ha- without being able to stand up and tell the people the National Health Service is safe in my hands. Yeah. If she doesn't say that in the run-up to the election, she's not prime minister. Isn't that amazing? So you, have, you effectively have two forms of socialism uh, as your choice in Britain. You have the lesser form of socialism, which is the Conservative Party, that's their name, and then you have socialism under the Labour Party. Yeah. Uh, but she, too, had to run socialism. Simon, this is what I... I, I was at, working at Fox uh, a little over a year and a half ago, when Obama decided to push forward after the Massachusetts mm-hmm. election and get this and try to pass this bill. Mm-hmm. And I remember talking to several Democrats and I say, what are you guys doing? You're going to get creamed in the election. Mm-hmm. But they, this is what they, they came back to them. They said, you know what? We believe Americans love entitlements. And once we get them hooked on this entitlement, they'll yep. never let go. And we may lose this election, but we'll be back. And you're exactly right. We'll have shifted the playing field. Absolutely. There will be no conservative, real conservative. There will be no America left. It will just be varying degrees of government control and socialism. Varying degrees. And I've got to to tell you, we don't don't have time for the full story, but in all all seriousness, the national, Britain's National Health Service killed my father. That's absolutely a true story. Um, um, And one day I'll tell it to you. Uh, Again, a question uh, from one of our our listeners wants to know, and I'm actually quite interested as well, why did you back on Spectre's 2004 re-election bid? We were at a 51-49 majority in the United States Senate. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was in the leadership of the United States Senate. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, the most important thing that that we could do, looking in the next uh, two to four years, uh, with hopefully a re-elected President Bush, was to fill two, and we thought potentially even three or four, Supreme Court seats. Mm-hmm. Uh, Arlen Specter, as you know, uh, was is a linchpin and was a linchpin in getting moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats to vote for Supreme Court justices. And uh, Senator Specter uh, uh, said to me uh, when he asked, he came and asked for my support to help campaign at the end of this campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said he asked for my support. I said, I would only give you support if you promise me that as chairman of the Judiciary Committee, that you will shepherd Bush's pre- judicial nominations through and particular Supreme Court nominations. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to me, um, if Arlen Specter was for a, a, a Bush appointee, they would be confirmed. Mm-hmm. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. And if you look at the record, mm-hmm. Arlen Specter not only defended John Roberts, but he, he, without question, Sam Alito would not be on the court today if it was not for Arlen Specter. So my feeling mm-hmm. was, take the political heat, which I did and continue to take, Mm -hmm. to do what I thought was in the best interest of our country, which was long-term, to have uh, leaders on the United States Supreme Court to protect our freedoms. It's a very honest answer. You did a deal. I did a deal. Yep. Which I thought was in the best interest of the conservative cause of my country. Very, very honest answer. Uh, You you announced uh, your your candidacy for the presidency and then immediately uh, put yourself in the middle of the Iowa abortion debate. (laughs) Um, where uh, where the uh, the house once again has put in a 20 week ban right. and it's uh, going to the Iowa Senate where it actually will be tossed out I, I predict very strongly that that's what's going to happen um, obviously that's a matter that's very close to your heart yeah look I, I introduced a bill and and uh, and worked on a bill called partial birth, birth abortion mm-hmm. which was not a ban on abortion but was in fact a um, uh, a restriction on abortion mm-hmm. I absolutely respect and there were people at the time that i did that said we should we can't do that we just we have to either go for a ban or do nothing Mm -hmm. and i respect that i i do i i think that's a very reasonable approach to take that Mm -hmm. any type of chipping away at the edges makes it more palatable for people to keep abortion legal that's the argument i i i I see that argument Uh, my perspective is that it's it's always good to highlight uh, and and work on things that bring abortion, the reality of abortion, to the eyes of the American public. And mm-hmm. and when we, we we talk about the fetal pain bill, you actually uh, you actually demonstrate to the American public, or in this case, the people in Iowa, you know that. We're talking about children who are fully formed, who can survive in many cases outside the womb and who actually, you know, feel pain because babies in the womb feel pain. And so the more we can we can sensitize people to the reality of life in the womb, that who Mm -hmm. this child really is. I think that's a good debate to have. I think that moves the ball forward. And uh, well, again, I. I'm not. Uh, people ask me, "Will you are, will you criticize people who uh, who are blocking this?" No, I won't, because I I, I accept their passion and their uh, and their uh, their desire to uh, 
to try a different tact. Uh, my feeling is that tact hasn't worked particularly well. Mm -hmm. And now almost, you know, well, 40 years, almost 40 years after Roe versus Wade. And so I think sensitizing people, I'll give you one final point is sure. on partial birth in the late 1990s, when I was the one leading the charge on the floor of the United States Senate, it was really the first time since Roe versus Wade that attitudes on abortion began to change mm -hmm. because we began to talk about this child being born all but the head and we saw so pictures of the baby in the doctor's hand and and the baby alive and the doctor killing it and they couldn't deny the abortion you couldn't deny that abortion was taking of a human life i mean mm -hmm. it was right there and this, this is another example i think where we can make that case and i think it's worth making okay i know i have to let you go and i'm and i'm gonna let you go i do have one final question uh we we seem to have a president in the oval office right now that does not respect the office the 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 most dramatic example of that was the picture of him with his feet up on the resolute desk uh, how important is it that we have a president who respects that office well i think it i think the um respect for the office means respect for the values of our country mm -hmm. i mean i think that's uh, when president obama was uh, candidate obama he was going around talking about hope and change before he before he got to the hope and change he did a pretty blistering attack on this country mm -hmm. and what this country stood for. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the president of the United States gets up at a, at a, uh, a speech and talks about Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security and, and says that America was not a great country until those programs were passed, mm -hmm. that tells me that this president doesn't understand that this country was founded great. I had Al Sharpton call me a racist the other day because I said because I I said that the president uh, the I'm president smi I'm smiling because I've had that charge yeah well posed at me yeah, I've well. had that's the second time in a year that mm -hmm. Al Sharpton's called me a racist so on two different occasions for two different things so uh, but you know my feeling is that yeah you know, sure did America have problems it, when it was founded sure it had problems of course but it was founded great it was mm -hmm. founded on the principles that I talked about earlier the principles of of respecting life liberty and the pursuit of happiness and 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 that rights came from God and that we were there we we were a country that was a moral enterprise one that is still improving and perfecting we hope uh but one is in danger of being curtailed and and that's why i'm here and that's why i'm fighting and that's why i'm in this race 